In the current climate we live in where characters that commit war crimes are more beloved than characters that would never even hurt a fly, it's no wonder that the return of the Dune franchise was such a huge success. It gives us the father of all edgelords, Paul Atreides, and everyone seems to love him. And I mean, can you blame them? Look at this guy. Has long luscious hair, comes from a special lineage, can throw hands, and most importantly, goes from a good guy to being a genocidal maniac. And you know what that means? He's literally me- in the following video, I'll be using Anakin Skywalker, Eren Yeager, and Paul Atreides as a case study to explore this idea of the future. This obviously means that I will be spoiling their respective series, Star Wars, Attack on Titan, and the latest two Dune movies. Note that I will not be mentioning the books whatsoever. You have been warned. The tragic hero, according to Aristotle, are flawed individuals who commit, without evil intent, great wrongs or injuries that ultimately lead to their misfortune, often followed by tragic realization of the true nature of events that led up to this. This means that the tragic hero by the end of the story still must be, to some degree, morally grounded. The tragic hero archetype goes all the way back to the start of literature itself, with it really becoming popular through Shakespeare's famous play Macbeth. Funnily enough, this was also the first time I experienced what a tragic hero was like, all the way back in school. Yes, I was six foot three and had a fully grown beard. For a 13 year old Huss, this was more than just another boring set of English classes. It was the first time I looked at a story beyond the typical hero defeating the villain narrative. Macbeth was a respected warrior, honored for his bravery and loyalty to King Duncan. However, eventually he meets three witches who give him a look into the future, prophesizing that he will become king. His ambition had won him his kingdom, yet ultimately it led to his downfall, as his guilt and paranoia festered, ending with his tyranny being brought to an end in the same way that he gained it, the righteous ambition of another man. And you know what I thought when I first heard this? He's literally me. But no, honestly, it was the first time I felt a true sense of tragedy for a character. And more importantly, it made me question a lot of things. Hashtag I'm 13 and this is deep. But I realize now that every question I had surrounded this one idea, the future. I mean, if I could see the future, that would be cool, right? And if I didn't like it, I can change it into anything I want. But what if it's impossible to change the future? What if no matter what I did, the future was gonna play out exactly how I saw it? It was determined. Am I free? Or what if it was the opposite? What if I had prescience so I was like Doctor Strange and I could predict every single possible future? That would be a lot better, right? But if I can see every possible future, then what would be the point in having it? I mean, I've already experienced it. Okay, now I'm starting to feel trapped. Get me the f out of here. I don't really consider myself to be an altruistic person. So for me, I'm looking at this from like a, you know, very selfish perspective. But what would it mean for a hero whose job is to be righteous and help others? And why is it so common for authors to use the future specifically to bring about the hero's downfall? And it's these type of questions that make the tragic hero one of my favorite archetypes in fiction. It evokes a unique emotion that you can only really describe as like a, a sympathetic sense of pity. I don't know if that even makes sense, but it's something that you don't really get for any other archetype. And if you were to ask me who my two favorite favorite characters were that fell into this archetype, I would say Eren Yeager from Attack on Titan and Anakin Skywalker from Star Wars. That's why I was gassed when I went on social media and saw all these comparisons between Anakin, Eren and Paul, who now after finishing Dune 2 and just finished reading Dune Messiah stands as one of my favorite characters ever. But once again, what appealed to me the most about these characters was this idea of the future and the spectrum of autonomy that they all fall under. You may think they are very similar when looking at them from like a surface level point of view. See future, turn bad but you'd be surprised at how vastly different they use this idea of the future for their respective character arc. And I think by using these three characters as a case study, it gives us an interesting message that we could all find useful by answering a very specific question. What would happen if you could see the future? Or why is it good that we can't see the future? I don't know, maybe that sounds a little bit better. But regardless, join me on this journey as I explore this topic by looking at Paul Atreides and his prescience, Eren and the relationship between free will and determinism, and Anakin Skywalker, the journey we take towards an inevitable fate or to make it sound a little fancier, fatalism. But yeah, let's get straight into it. Paul stands as such a unique and interesting character and a big part of that is obviously due to his prescience. He has the ability to see multiple futures. This makes him distinct even in the tragic hero archetype as most characters that fall into it like Macbeth, Eren and Anakin who happen to utilize this future trope do so in more of a deterministic format. This means that for them the future plays out just as they see it regardless of the dark implications it has or the journey they take to get there. That being said Paul's ability to see the future is still technically a form of determinism. That's because of all the futures he sees, the path he picks is the one with the least friction in the transition from a dying empire to a new one and the empire's death has been a long time coming because of many 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 factors beyond his control but it's still a more soft kind of determinism and it's still very 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 unique so that we can make a clear distinction between him and other characters that can see the future and i really think the way prescience is used with paul on both an individual character level and when linking it to the overall themes and narrative of the story is you know genius 
you'd think that this ability ascends Paul from a human to this god figure, but I'd argue it's the opposite. It's what takes Paul from a human to an animal, which might sound a little bit weird, but you know, give me a moment to explain. That being said, I'm a huge advocate of the idea that if you really want to understand a character, then the best place to start is the author, as you may be surprised at how often the main character is simply their own self inserts. Funnily enough, however, Frank Hubert, the man that wrote the books all the way back in 1965, emerges as one of the few that I think does the opposite. Paul is everything that he despises, and in the hours of hours of research I did about the man, I couldn't find anything that linked the two together on a personal level outside of using Paul as a tool for his cautionary tale on the White Saviour complex. Hubert is famous for his dislike of charismatic leaders, with quotes you might have heard before like all charismatic leaders should come with a warning sign on their head saying, I am dangerous to you. He even on presidents like John F. Kennedy because no one really questioned him, whilst praising worse presidents like Richard Nixon because it made us doubt the government. Well, I think that, that our society was formed on a distrust for government and uh, uh, we've seemed to have lost that distrust of government. The one thing I can comfortably say about Huber is that at his core, he was a man that loved to question things that aren't typically questioned, questioning our absolutes. This includes ideas like religion, prophecy, government, and the people that we put into power, etc. His most prominent piece of advice to a group of UCLA students is that you should examine your mythologies, examine your absolutist ideas, and to always question things. And if he was alive today, I'm sure he would have hated the current state of the world because of how much they obviously had I know that they're hiding a real life Barney the Dinosaur in Area 51. I know it. And of course, this is all reflected in the Dune books that he wrote. He uses the story to deconstruct the Chosen One trope by showing that no such thing truly exists and that we shouldn't advocate for something we don't truly understand because there will be consequences for it. What is this figure we've put into power? And how does this reflect on the people choosing to do this in society? From the very start of the first movie, it's made clear that the Messiah prophecy in Dune was completely made up by the Bene Gesserit as a form of control. And every supposed miracle that Paul and Jessica could do was something that they were simply trained to do. And that's something that Paul had an understanding for. And his eventual acceptance of the false prophecy is a culmination of his descent. I like to think that he's more akin to a Dejal or also known as the Antichrist kind of figure because in the end all he brought about was destruction. He was a false messiah. Although, you know, Frank would probably hate the idea because it's still related to prophecy and religion and, you know, he hates religion and prophecy, I think. <laughs> He leads them into a war of suffering, but in this case, there is no heaven or hell in Dune. There's no benefit from being a martyr. There's only ideas implanted by the Bene Gesserit and the society who suffer as a result of Paul's decision, and more importantly, the people that put him into power in the first place. But outside of looking at it from a societal perspective, we see the negative implications of being a prophet or a charismatic leader on an individual level in Paul, with the development of his loneliness throughout the movie. Using Stilgar as an example, he goes from being a genuine teacher slash father figure in his life, post his father Leto's death, to not even letting him take a shit without shouting Lisan al Gaib. He gains... No. He loses a friend and gains a worshipper. But that being said, nothing I've really said so far has provided anything new of value to the discussion, as numerous people have explored Frank Hubert's views on leaders, prophecies, politics, etc. through his story Dune. What I really wanted to find out is why Frank Herbert uses the future to convey all of these messages. Why is it the foundation of Paul's character and in turn the story? If it was to only critique the white saviour complex, then I'm sure he could have done it in a much clearer way, without allowing the future to be a somewhat justification for Paul's actions. I don't necessarily agree with that sentiment, but I can't hate on Paul apologists the same way I do for kind of Anakin and Aaron apologists. I mean, if it was the best path for humanity's survival, then from a utilitarian perspective, he's correct. Of course, you're throwing away a lot of nuances for Paul's character, hashtag I'm just saying, but you know, you're valid for that, I guess. But like I previously said, after reading and listening to hours and hours of his interviews, I think I was able to find an answer to these questions. Frank makes numerous remarks about how he takes a heavy interest in the idea of the future. And ultimately, a part of the reason he has a dislike for prophecy, powerful leaders, or, or background organizations, is that he hates the idea that they think they can control the future. I like the fact that we cannot predict the future. I like the fact that we live in a universe where anything can happen, because the alternative to me is a constricting dead end. And once you get this, understanding the beauty and tragedy behind Paul's character becomes that much easier to comprehend. Paul being able to see multiple futures means that technically Paul has choices. One future isn't set in stone, and that gives you the illusion that he maintains his agency. He is to some extent free, but it's actually quite the opposite. It's made clear to the viewer that the future he sees directly contradicts his personality and desires. This sadly means that he is defined by this ability, and any personality he has gets slowly removed as we get deeper and deeper into the narrative. And we can see the effects of this from all the way back at the start of the story. During Paul's early characterization, we see that he's 
starts off as a very prideful young man. A man who respects his father, but more importantly, there's a sense of your typical 15 year old boyish wonder in Paul. And it's almost as if the very, very early parts of June focused on this inner conflict between his role as the future head of the Atreides and this want to go outside and explore. But this natural human conflict gets put into the background almost instantaneously, as we see that he was easily susceptible to any kind of influence, whether it was good or bad. And it's this foundation that allows us to really understand the detriment of a hypothetical scenario where you could see the future. Just a few visions of the future has already had a huge influence on Paul as it's made him a lot more curious about the outside world and what his destiny is, turning this childish want to explore into a more negative thing, more akin to a responsibility. This is reflected in his growing fear of what's to come, as he's already on a battle to try and prevent the future he sees, with his older brother figure Duncan Idaho's death, already imposing a very heavy role on Paul. This brings me onto that very scene, as one of the first things that struck me in this movie was his response to Paul revealing a possible future of his demise. Dreams make good stories, but everything important happens when we're awake because that's when we make things happen. If we link this to Frank Hubert's already established view about the unknownness of the future, being a part of what makes us human, we see that Paul is simply a man who's never been able to truly experience what we call living. Paul is inherently at odds with the human experience as it contradicts this ability to see the future. And it's because of that, I don't think it's ever really possible to kind of understand what he's experiencing, not to a full extent anyways, and that's okay. Arguably even the point, and I think the person that explains what I mean the best is the author himself. If you could see the future, it would be an art of bore. Your life would be on instant replay. You'd be sitting here now lamenting me saying it and you would not be able to change a thing. Isn't it more interesting to live in a universe where unknowns are discovered, with new lands to explore, than to live in an absolute box where when you find the edge, that's it baby, nowhere to go from there. It is the unexpected, the surprises that make the important differences in our lives, even some of the nasty surprises, and that's exactly it. Part of being human is how we deal with the surprises of life, and without it, it's almost as if we're just walking robots. I don't think power corrupts, Rather, I think power attracts the corruptible. Paul's strong principles remain up until the last quarter of Dune 2, and it's here where we see the typical hero's morality being his downfall, as he realises more and more that he has less choices in, in picking the best path possible. But this doesn't mean that I agree with the people who try and justify Paul, as there's more than enough to criticise some of his choices post Leto's death. However, more than that, especially compared to the other two, Paul is also a victim of what these stories try and critique. He's a victim to the Bene Gesserit's years and years of manipulation and breeding, a victim to the horrible political landscape, and all this comes together when he makes a decision to amplify his prescience by drinking from the water of life. We see how this causes his demeanour to change as it carries an even more tragic weight behind it, having relinquished the joy of existence upon foreseeing the path ahead. Paul Atreides chose to be blind. He chose to give up his agency and in turn chose to give up what it meant to be human. He remains unaffected by the loss of the Fremen, who he previously clearly had a lot more sympathy for. And all life in general, we are dealing with somebody who has now long accepted his inevitable fate, having started another holy war. He's become chained down to his ability to see the future, a slave to it, having made the ultimate commitment to the golden path. And maybe I feel this way because I'm a bitch, but by the end of the movie, I'm left with a really uncomfortable and eerie feeling about Paul. And I am affirmed of this the most when listening to Frank Hubert talk about humans and animals. I think it makes humans uncomfortable, the idea that a human being can become anything other than a human being, especially something mindless and out of the depths. I'm very heavily imbued with union psychology, so I think that we do have a sense of this mindless animal in the depths of all of us. Paul has become an animal. He can no longer be controlled by the likes of the Bene Gesserit or his mother. He is no longer the human that took the test. The only thing that truly controls him is an ability that I would personally describe to be as mindless and out of the depths of human understanding, that being his prescience. And I think the analogy of Paul being an animal works so well because animals have emotions, immense emotions. And I think that commonality that an animal has with human beings is a thing that he tries his best to hold on to. And it's for this reason that he values Chani so much, as she serves as his only remaining link to it. Ultimately, Dune doesn't critique the white savior trope from an outside perspective only. It doesn't only warn us to rely on ourselves instead of relying on the ideas or figures that we don't truly understand like Paul. It also critiques the individual experience of those in power, from supposedly righteous leaders like Leto, all the way to the man of the hour, Paul. And even though I'm not sure Frank himself is going to like what I have to say, I think we understand enough so that we feel sorry for Paul, and have sympathy for a man burdened with power. So what is it that we sympathise with Paul for? Well, it's the fact that he can see the future. That's what it's always been. Not the fact that his father died. <coughs> what? <coughs> My voice cracked. Sorry about that. I was not crying. Please don't, don't put that on me. <laughs> Anyways, back to the video. Not the fact that his father died and not the fact that his mother becomes evil, but it's the agency he's been robbed of because of this ability. Each option before him seems to be devoid of promise. To me, Paul appears akin to a monarch bound to his throne, possessed by immense power yet lacking true autonomy. And ironically, it's because of that power that I can't really ever understand that to me, Paul emerges as the character whom I find the strongest connection with, the character I found the most relatable. I think even though we 
we don't know the future there are certain circumstances where we are dealing with a fate that's inevitable something that we can never change and something that we eventually have to accept and for a lot of us this brings us to our darkest moments in life whilst others are able to move beyond it and i'm pretty sure you can guess which one paul falls into when is a gift not a gift i know i have been abusing frank hubert quotes throughout this section but i really do think there is a sense of wisdom in his words especially when discussing this idea of the future although i don't agree with everything he has to say the whole idea of the future struck me as rather interesting because that's almost a precipitarian statement if it's the future it's already there and we're simply just approaching it nothing's going to change it will just unfold suddenly. The future is one of the great mythological statements that's buried in the language. What I'm addressing is this whole idea of absolutes and your helplessness in the face of such overwhelming movements in mankind. I think what we can take away from Paul is that seeing the future in and of itself is something that can entrap us, even if we can see numerous versions of it. I'll expand on this a bit more towards the end of the video, but ultimately, on a spectrum of agency and its relationship to the future, I think I've shown that although Paul has choices, it still removes his agency to a certain extent. And that's why I'd put him here. What if free will and determinism can coexist? I think that's an idea that AOT explores in a very interesting manner through Eren, and that's what I'll be looking at next. Quickly, before we move on to the next section, I I'd just like to say that if you have been enjoying this video so far feel free to leave a like genuinely that's the only way i get any appreciation for these videos so you know it would mean the world to me also if you are interested in helping this small channel grow feel free to subscribe you know that also means a lot to me it's like i'm building a little family it's a little bit corny but i mean it uh, and yeah let's get straight back into the video Although, in my opinion, both are very different characters, I think the best way to transition from Eren to Paul is to talk about how structurally they are actually kind of similar. Now, if you're familiar with both characters, I'm sure you can connect how they are in some ways very much like each other. But one thing I'd like to focus on is their innate reasoning for following the future they do. One of my favourite sequences in Dune is the tent scene, and it's here we see how the collective consciousness of humanity, yearning for renewal, is in a sense the terrible purpose that Paul feels in the tent sequence. This aligns with my point that the future he sees isn't in line with what he wants, or in turn, who he is. But like I said, what remains is an innate purpose to follow this path, no matter what foreseeable destruction he causes. Or as they say in the younger generation of today, <laughs> crash out. I'm not an old man, by the way. I'm, I'm 20 and um, I don't even know if I used that word correctly. Now, if you equate Aaron and Paul, this would be the equivalent of Aaron's childish desire for freedom, shackling him to a particular path in the future. And this has always been my favorite aspect of Aaron's character, an innate desire to destroy everything. Now, I'm not gonna go really deep with this point because I kind of made a video about cautionary characters and that was the focus of Aaron's section. Check it out after the video if you're interested. Now, this similarity between Aaron and Paul, I'm guessing is the reason that a lot of people want Timothy in Chalamet to play Eren in an AOT live action which <laughs> no <laughs> for the love of god no but once you get past these surface level similarities I think they are actually quite different pretty much the inverted versions of each other in fact now we can see this in the two key differences between them Eren's arc deconstructs the chosen one trope in a more positive manner than Paul's does I think this is mainly because it happens well before he becomes a genocidal maniac in seasons one to three which to me are the most underrated parts of Eren's character I think there's numerous beautiful messages involved in the arc one of them being that Eren specifically isn't special, rather every person is special because they were born into this world, which might sound a little bit corny, but always brings a tear to my eyes. <laughs> so real shame how he ended up, but you know, shout out to my boy Eren in season three. And number two, the focus of this video, the way Eren experiences the future and how it affects him is completely different. For some reason, I've seen a lot of people think that the way Eren sees the future is like Paul in that he sees numerous versions of it and he picked the best path. When it's not like that at all, as a matter of fact, some of the biggest moments in the final arc are meant to show you the exact opposite. AOT's universe follows a more deterministic timeline where everything happens just as it is. There's no multiple scenarios. I don't know how else to explain it. There's no ifs or buts. If something happens, happens it happens now what that means for Eren is that when he sees the future it plays out exactly how he sees it and you would think that means he has no choice in the situation but I don't think that's the case at all he's not a walking robot on a one-way road Eren ultimately highlights a case of an individual who sees a future reflective of himself a cruel destiny that was completely self-imposed and that's what I want to explore in this section. Now, that being said, to really understand Eren, you have to understand this idea of compatibilism, which is the belief that both determinism and free will can coexist together. But I think in order to get this, we need to look at this from more of a phenomenological perspective. Let's really try and understand what seeing the future in Eren's perspective would be like, because I think it's way easier to imagine than someone like Paul. Every one of the nine titans has the ability to experience the memories of past users. Pre-final episode, Armin, the current user of the Colossal Titan, can experience Bart can experience Bert, Hole 2, Bethelian... 
Befeithe, Berto, I don't know how to say his name, bro. Bert Holt's previous memories of his life. The attack Titan, however, has the unique ability to pass memories backwards from a future holder of the Titan to the previous holder. In that way, they have access to the future. So what that means in this scenario is that an older Eren sent his memories to the previous holder of the attack Titan, his father, Grisha Jaeger. So in that sense, Grisha saw the future. But Eren is the final attack Titan. So how the hell does he have access to future memories? Well, like I said, all the nine Titans have the common ability to experience memories of people that used to have it past memories. Now, Eren is in a unique situation. These memories not only include Grisha's own experience, but also the memories that future Eren sent to him. As a result, when Eren delves into his father's life, he is also witnessing the future memories that an older Eren had transmitted to Grisha. So what was the point of that really dumbed down explanation that was still probably complex and bad because I'm not good at explaining stuff in general? <gasps> I've now established that he sees the future through memories. This links into the compatibilism point I mentioned, which is vital to understanding why Isayama incorporates the future in the first place, outside of it being pivotal to arguably one of the greatest plot twists of all time. Let's look at what a memory is. A memory refers to the psychological process of acquiring, storing, and retaining, and later retrieving information of an experience that's already happened. Now imagine a memory you have of yourself when you were younger. The main feeling you probably have with that memory is that it's already happened. But now instead of it happening in the past, imagine it happened in the future. I don't know, maybe this is still kind of hard to understand, but what you really need to know is that for Eren, it feels like these events have already happened far before they actually do. And that in itself creates a feeling of inevitability. Like I said, it would fall into the idea of compatibilism, where both his free will and determinism exist together. What this means is that the future happened because deep down, Eren wanted this future to happen. His numerous convictions, like wanting to protect his friends, saving Paradis, and deep down wanting to erase humanity beyond the walls due to his attachment to the dream of a boundless outside world that he can't bring himself to let go of, is what led him to seeing that future. It's a manifestation of who he is, a person that constantly keeps moving forward without sitting down and enjoying what he currently has. This idea can get a bit complicated sometimes, but I think the scene that shows it the best is the one of Eren and the poor children, Ramsey and Halil, when he visits Mali. Also, it's very important to note that Eren did not see the whole future, he saw it in bits and pieces. This is easier to understand in the manga because Isayama displays it as kind of shards of memories, but in the anime they don't really do this, so it went over a lot of people's heads, understandably. Eren saving the child from getting beaten up was one of the future memories that he saw, but when we reached that moment, he he realized how much of a hypocrite he is. He is going to be the killer of that child regardless. So he decided to try and avoid saving him because there's no point to it. However, after hearing the kids screaming in agony, he can't help himself. So he turns around and saves him regardless. This is essentially meant to represent his experience with the future and the rumbling as a whole. He makes pathetic attempts to try and change it, but it never really can because he wants the future to play out as he saw it. Ultimately, Eren serves as a person who has an innate desire to go forward and beyond, regardless of how dark the path ahead is. It's in his nature and that's reflected in the different dynamics and interactions he has in the series. One, for example, would be the scene of him killing those adults when he was like 10, or his nature versus nurture dynamic with his brother Zeke, who was nurtured into a child soldier by his father, Grisha, whilst Eren ultimately was free to do as he liked because Grisha raised him in a different way, yet he still ended up being this you know, menace. Eren's individual demise for me comes when he unlocks the founding titan's power completely towards the end of the series. And it's here he gets the ability to see the past, future and present at the same time. <laughs> Not only does it absolutely annihilate the guy mentally by being stuck in a never ending eternity, but ultimately it shows how he was the one that ruined his own life. And for me, that is the greatest tragedy, the tragedy of Eren Yeager. A lot of people dislike the whole plot twist with Eren being the one that sent Dinah to kill his mother. But to me, it just serves as the ultimate reaffirmance of what Eren is. A man hell bent on moving forward, no matter what the cost. He manipulated his dad, his friends, and in the end, his own mother. I think it's meant to be an uncomfortable realization of how committed Eren was to this path. He embodies the tragic hero archetype because of this future tool, as it shows how Eren's good heartedness, wanting to protect his friends, has led him down an evil and unforgivable path, where we slowly unveil how corrupted of an individual he truly was. The way he went about it brought him and his own demise. Even being the cause of some of his friends' deaths and becoming strangers to them, it shows the dangers of being stuck on a path forward, looking nowhere else. And obviously, the future is the foundation of that. So it kind of shows us what would happen if we looked at the future being stuck on a one-way path? <laughs> Ultimately, the end of Eren's journey leaves me with a question. Does seeing the future really affect anything? Would Eren have gone down this path even if he couldn't have seen the future of it? And obviously this is up to interpretation, of course, but I like to think yes and no. If Eren was anything other than Eren, he would have seen a better future. But what he sees is a reflection of who he is and what he wants, a dark truth that he slowly comes to terms with in the last four years of his life. He starts off making a strong commitment to Flock and Historia, thinking that he was justified in his actions 
actions, only to slowly realize that what he's doing isn't a reflection of his circumstances, but rather a reflection of what he wants, his desires. He went to Mali and saw that there were people just like him, through Falco, the two children, Ramsey and Halil, and the numerous other people he met, yet he still kept moving forward. I like to look at the Attack Titan's ability as the culmination of Eren's fatal flaw, his need to burn everything to the ground. AOT is a story that deals with numerous complex themes, but in the end, I'd like to think that the message is really simple. Yes, we live in a horrible world, but that isn't mutually exclusive to it being a wonderful one. It's a realistic message that forces us to acknowledge both sides of this world its cruelty and beauty. That being said, from the very first chapter, Eren is someone who primarily focuses on that one half, the cruelty, and that's all he ever really focuses on, outside of those few moments that he looks beyond it, which funnily enough were his happiest moments. The future is just a physical manifestation of his ideology, or the most extreme test of his character. Even after seeing the horrifying results of his actions, he still resorts to the one solution he's always known, destroying things. And what that means is that the only thing he was ever a slave to was himself. At his core, he never changes, and the future only serves as a tool for showcasing this cautionary tale. Now talking about cautionary tales, <laughs> I made a video about it. You know, shout out, shout out us. I think what we can take away from Eren is that we need to enjoy today, because if you can't enjoy today, you'll never be able to enjoy tomorrow. Did I make that quote up? I don't know. Actually, maybe I've heard it before. I think I made it up. You know what, give me credit for it unless you can prove me wrong. Now, when looking at the spectrum of autonomy that I've created, Eren would be free, as the future reflects his own decisions and nature compared to a pool that sees the future that directly contradicts him as a person. But what would a person who is completely chained to one specific event, regardless of what path they take, look like? A person who is truly and utterly chained down to the universe. Let's take a look at fatalism through Anakin Skywalker, aka Darth Vader. Like I said, what interests me the most about Anakin is his relationship to a specific event or a fate or a prophecy. That's why I think it's more accurate to use the idea of fatalism to describe Anakin's relationship with the future. Fatalism is a doctrine that events are fixed in advance so that human beings are powerless to change them. With Eren and Paul, a lot of their path can be seen with every choice involved. With Eren specifically, for example, every choice and action he makes was determined. It doesn't change. However, with Anakin, it's a key event that's determined, like the fact that he brings balance to the Force or the fact that Padme is going to die. So regardless of if he sits and drinks a cup of coffee for the rest of his life or goes on a genocidal rampage, that event will happen. In this spectrum of autonomy that I've created, aka how free a character is, I'd argue that Anakin is the least free by far, a true victim of his fate. And that's what I'd like to explore in this section, by taking a look at his life. By the way, I'm really bad of Star Wars name, so like, please don't cook me. Anakin was born of the Force. It was in response to Palpatine's dark side manipulations. Now, despite George Lucas never giving an explanation, one thing remains certain. He was created for a purpose. He is not afforded the existential optimism of Carla Yeager that simply being born is special. To Jean-Paul Sartre, Anakin would be a metaphysical abomination for his essence preceded his existence. As such, he was gifted with a high midichlorian count. Raised in slavery, pod racing was his only to escape the most freedom he can ever feel he was in complete control the technology channeled through his force amplified reflexes gave him freedom his intuitive skills in mechanical engineering is an extension of this i'm good at fixing things the power to create and fix gives him a sense of autonomy that he's always lacked the liberating feeling that technology and his high midichlorian count gave him was what won him his freedom but his new life was not what he expected he wished that qui-gon had come to free him and he saw that the jedi order were detached and apathetic they were not fixing things, merely serving a higher purpose, a galactic republic that was corrupt and left him and his mother to rot in slavery. The serving of a higher power is similar to Anakin's relationship to the prophecy and the force itself. His love for Padme was an escape, a distraction, a lonely child's desire for connection with the one person who recognized him. You're a slave? I'm a person and my name is Anakin. And it's why she fell for him. She empathized with his struggle. The two took up roles in institutions that gave them great power to make a change and help people, but ultimately prevented them from doing it. They were forced to suppress their desires to serve a higher power. Episode two opens up with Padme grieving the death of her decoy. I like to think that this mirrors Anakin's own guilt over the death of Shmi. Shmi, how do you say these names, bro? Shmi. He could not stop her death because of his Jedi duties. This is why he was so susceptible to Palpatine's grooming. Now, when looking at the prophecy, it's never outright declared. Whether or not it was real or misread doesn't really matter, even though Lucas has confirmed it, and I know he just ruins every kind of theory that there's no such thing as the chosen one trope, whatever, right? The prophecy is never outright declared. Whether or not it was real or misread didn't matter. It was a tool used to control Anakin. Like Paul, Anakin's Mahdi status was self-fulfilling and deconstructed the tragic implications of a chosen one. The name itself inherently 
openly declares a lack of autonomy. I have brought peace, freedom, justice and security to my new empire. Anakin had begun to fix things and do what the Galactic Republic couldn't. Ultimately, Anakin develops negatively as a result of what he sees. He fears the future and he fears losing the ones he loves. As a result, he loses the stoic mentality of the Jedi and falls to the darkness, becoming somebody who's easy to manipulate due to his pure desperation. He looks for dependency and finds it in Palpatine and in his attempts to prevent the future, he causes his own demise. However, that being said, I think the future is simply used as a tool to exasperate an already weakening relationship with the light. I think the best way I can describe Anakin and his relationship to the future is somebody that's simply too emotional to ever be a complete Jedi. To me, the future was simply the nail in the coffin for Anakin. To put this in human terms, I like to think that everybody in your life, including me and you, experiences a huge trial. No matter what your belief system is, if you do live a long life, it's almost guaranteed that this has happened to you, or it will happen to you. And I like to think that these trials are proportionate to what you are and what you value. If you're a doctor whose main priority is to value the lives of his patients, maybe one day you'll fail a surgery. If you're a child, maybe you're put in a situation where you lose all your friends. The point is, is that eventually you'll be put in a situation where you're defined by your strength and how you react to it. The weak will be destroyed and the strong will prevail. Tough time never lasts. And in Anakin's case, he had failed that test long before he ever really started it. The Jedi could never provide him with what he needed, to stand firm in the face of destiny. This might be a controversial opinion in the Star Wars community, but I like to think that Anakin was bound to fall to the dark side. Regardless of the future he sees, it would have just taken him a little bit longer. Is that because Anakin just wasn't built like that? Or is that because Obi-Wan could never really handle being a mentor for him? Because he was too young compared to his own mentor? Who knows? But I really think the writing was on the wall. That being said, I really like the way Lucas utilizes the future because I think how somebody treats the future is what brings around their own suffering. And that's a message I think we can all take away from Anakin. That being said, Anakin's experience with the two futures he knows is quite different. Outside of the dark dimension stuff from the comics, which, you know, amazing stuff, <laughs> check that out if you haven't, there's a key difference between how Anakin experienced both of these. He tried to fight the future and because of it, Padme's death happened. He gave up on the Chosen One future, you know, the prophecy that he will bring balance to the Force, and it happened. Anakin's fear of losing anything is the clearest sign of his battle with fatalism. Anakin will stop at nothing to change the path of events because he is determined to save the lives of the ones he loves, especially his wife Padme. But his attempts to resist fate only tighten its grip on him. The tragic story of Anakin Skywalker serves as a warning the perils of adopting a fatalistic mindset. Ultimately, I think it's really cool that almost half a century apart, you have guys like Asimov, Herbert, Isayama, all toying with the same idea, all relevant in both periods. The idea that desires changes the fluid nature of the future and cements it. And what's really interesting to me is that the desire a lot of the time isn't anything evil. It's renewal in the universe for the benefit of the people and freedom. So these desires being used for commentaries and cautionary tales like Paul and Aaron is so, so interesting to me. And I just had to make a video about it. Now, I was going to make this a whole section about, you know, this is the message you can take away, blah, blah, blah. But I think ultimately you guys are probably a lot smarter than me. Um, you know, the bigger message that we can take away here is that seeing the future would not be a good thing. But no, honestly, regardless of the way you see it or how much of it you do, it enslaves you in some way, shape or form. Whether that be to an ability, yourself or a specific event set in place. The beauty of life is not feeling trapped to a specific path, not knowing where your life can go and the surprises that it brings. I think the best way to conclude this video is to end off with one of my favourite movies of all time, Kung Fu Panda. No, we're not going to talk about how garbage that movie was. Whew, okay, no, relax, I'll just focus on the video. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'm kind of in the middle of my final semester at university, so I'm writing like four different 4,000 word essays at the same time, and I'm really struggling, so sorry if the script wasn't as good as it could have been. I'm, if I'm being honest, I kind of feel really disappointed in myself. I thought, you know, I could have made a much more clear and coherent script about this idea, and given it the time it deserves, but you know, life doesn't always play out how you want it to. Maybe that was the point of this video. That being said, I'm still new to making video essays, so hopefully it only gets better from here. Also, one thing I'm really interested in doing is starting a Patreon. Um, I kind of want to make much bigger projects, but <laughs> can't really afford it. So um, let me know what I could add to that Patreon that would make you interested. Maybe live reactions, um, you know, completely unedited videos that has stuff from the script I never added to the actual final product. Uh, I don't know. But if you are interested in supporting the channel in other ways, you know, feel free to subscribe, comment and like really really appreciate it you know and regardless if you just watched the video you spent time watching me talk and waffle about stuff i like i love you man i appreciate you man god bless and i hope you have a good day